Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. We are going to have an incredible conversation today all about A-B testing and personalization without sacrificing your site performance. Um, my name is Morgan Palomares. I have the privilege of leading our growth team here at Vercel. And today I'm going to be joined by Steve. Steve, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, sure. Hello, everybody. So I'm Steve. I'm co-founder and CEO of uh, Builder.io. Uh, I'm a technical co-founder, so I built first like half a million lines of code on this platform, but we've got a whole team working on it now. Um, uh, previously, though, I was running web engineering for a company called ShopStyle. And so this was a pretty large scale e-commerce company. And it was actually at that company that we were running into these situations where the marketing team would make very reasonable asks. Let's make some variations to pages based on menswear and women's wear shoppers. Let's run some simple A-B tests. And we ran into an enormous amount of problems that none of this could be delivered effectively uh, and performantly. And that was a huge genesis towards the building of our platform builder. And uh, part of why I'm so excited to talk today because of the fact that Intel sort of solutions like Vercel's and Next.js Edge middleware, there was not a good solution here. And so this will be really fun. So anyway, I'll, I'll pause it there. We'll talk about this more later. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. And Kylie, you want to introduce yourself? Sure thing. I am Kylie. I'm an engineering manager of the growth team here at Vercel. Uh, and previously, I actually worked as a consultant, a lot of JavaScript focused uh, clients, um, typically moving them over to Next.js on Vercel. So we usually leveraged uh, preview deployments and, um, you know, that auto uh, workflow that Vercel offers uh, to look at variants. Um, so it'll be interesting to continue this conversation as we uh, roll into the webinar. Awesome. Thank you. So um, we are going to have a very great conversation today. Um, we are going to be talking about experimentation and how you and your teams can actually ship and iterate on experiments without sacrificing site, site speed. We're going to go over the conversion paradox, which is something that Steve actually introduced me to, and I love that terminology. Then we'll dig into how to ship experiments with Vercel at the edge. And then we'll wrap up with iterating on experiments with Builder.io, talking a lot about workflow and collaboration. So it's going to be a great morning. Um, but to start us off, I wanted to just ground ourselves in experimentation. So um, we use that word a lot. And what does it really mean? So experimentation is this data-driven foundation of the decision-making process. And it helps us measure this precise impact of every change and release that we're making and evaluating whether or not our expectations meet the reality. And there's, of course, different types of experiments and a lot of different, um, different testing models available to increase your conversion rates and learn on your website. But for today's conversation, we're going to focus on A-B testing and personalization. You know, both of those methods can be used extremely effectively on their own, but they also can be used together and um, depending on what it is that you're trying to do. But at the end of the day, no matter what testing methodology that you're doing, the purpose of that um, of doing those experiments is to improve our users' experience on our website, and then in turn, obviously, generate more conversions and bring in more revenue. But um, it does lead to some challenges. So Steve, talk to me about the conversion paradox. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's a, a hilarious thing overall. So yeah, I mean, like Morgan was saying, if you are not running experiments, you're just guessing. And guessing is not usually the smartest way to actually understand your audience and grow your business. And so, and this was my experience back at ShopStyle, uh, the next thing you want to do is add some tools so you can run experiments. You might need some analytics side of things. Maybe you want to look at some heat map analytics. But more importantly, you want something that could allow you to run A-B testing. So like percentage-based variation tests, as well, well as personalization, like targeted content, you know, based on somebody's history, uh, utilizing your product or other things. Uh, now, the funny thing is this can fall into a paradox. The paradox is you add these tools to increase conversions. Most of these tools, if not just about everything that exists kind of before what we're talking about today, they would have a significant negative performance impact on your site. So in your effort to increase conversions, to make your site more effective, you shoot yourself in the foot. You end up making it so slow by loading up all these tools, you decrease conversions. And most importantly, 
you're generally blind to that because most people aren't looking at conversions before and after adding a tool. They generally add the tool and then look at conversions of variations made in the tool. And so that's something we want to talk about how you can actually solve so you can actually grow conversions without hurting yourself. And so a little bit more background on this sort of personalization paradox and why personalization tends to lead to poor performance is really there's kind of a few buckets of how people do it. Um, one bucket is round trips to your origin. And so that's kind of what you're seeing in this visual. This is where you're sending requests around the world to some origin server and you're doing server-side rendering on the fly. So every single visitor is getting a fresh generated page. Uh, that's slow in two ways. One is you're going around the world, whereas we'd rather utilize the edge, something much more geographically close, which we'll talk about in a minute. Fetching personalized content on the fly can be slow. Uh, rendering on the fly can be slow. But then you've got the client side uh, here as well, where whether it's using JavaScript to load personalization client side, so like a React component that fetches some extra personalized content, has layout shifts or other slowness, or you know some past tools, some more GUI-based tools of the past would use uh, blocking JavaScript. So they would completely block the page load and users can't see anything. Even though the page is actually there, it can't see anything because we need to fetch some other stuff and inject it. And those injections can actually not play well with React, which has a different rendering style. So it's just a bucket of problems, whether using all or just some of those techniques. And so just to see it sort of in bullet form, yeah, if we do it server side, you're paying the tax of on the fly rendering and round trips to an origin. If you're using blocking JavaScript, you're paying the tax of blocking page loads, which if you use any performance tooling, they will warn like crazy that please don't ever do this. Uh, and ultimately though, what our ideal is, uh, is what static site generation gives us today which is when a request comes in, it's immediately responded from the edge. There's no work to do, there's no fetching, there's nothing uh, going around the world, geographically close to fast responses, but everybody's seeing the same page. Anything that you need to be personalized is gonna have to lazy load. So maybe half the page is actually coming in after the fact. And again, that's not good for performance. You're waiting for the JavaScript to download, uh, waterfall fetches to happen. All of that's painful stuff that we want to avoid. Back to Morgan. Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the TLDR there in terms of the business impact that this has is that every second matters when it comes to your site's performance, especially with experiments. We know that I think it is 100 milliseconds of latency can cost you a 1% decrease in conversions. That's something that we, we talk a lot about at Purcell when we're shipping experiments on the growth team. But um, I pulled some of these stats from this report I found from Skilled, and it says, 79% of customers are dissatisfied with the site's performance, with the site's performance are less likely to buy from them again. So again, I wanna ground us in why we're doing experiments and who we're doing it for, which is our users and our customers. And we wanna ensure that they have the best experience on our site. And I know for myself um, as a marketing and growth leader and with many of the other marketing growth leaders I've worked with, thinking about site performance isn't super top of mind. We're thinking about our quarterly goals, hitting those business metrics, seeing the conversion rates, and we're not thinking so much about the bounce rates, how the, the impact that we have on our site. And so this is something that we do need to be thinking about, we want to be talking about. Obviously, this is why we're having this conversation today, but um, ultimately, uh, we want to be thinking and providing the best customer experience. So now that we know the impact, uh, let's talk about the solution. So everyone wants to figure out, obviously, okay, now we understand the problem. How do we get better at our experiments? So today we're going to cover three main um, best practices for you. Obviously, the first one, um, piggybacking off of what Steve was talking about, is like the first thing that you think of when you start shipping experiments is what tools am I going to be using? And oftentimes, marketing leaders like myself want to go find the easiest solution that doesn't require a ton of you know, dev edge work because there's plenty of other things on the roadmap that needs to get done, but you absolutely need to be thoughtful about the tools that you're using. You need to understand the impact it would add, the latency it would add on your site. You also want to ensure that you're experimenting at the edge. And uh, this is new, and we're going to definitely spend quite a bit of time talking about this today with Kylie, um, but this is something that we really want to encourage all of our customers and users to be doing with their teams. 
And then obviously we also want to enable this like end-to-end -end workflow where in fact devs and non-devs can iterate and collaborate with ease so that we can be shipping experiments and learning together because obviously that's what matters most. So Kylie, talk to us about shipping experiments at the edge. So as we talk about uh, the edge, I just want to clarify, take a step back and, and look, just talk about what edge middleware actually is for us. Uh, so it's code that executes before request is actually processed on the site. Um, it essentially acts as a content delivery network that sits between your website and the internet, keeping things uh, closest to either the requested location that you've provided to the middleware or, uh, yes, um, the uh, link to the docs are actually now in the chat as well for Cell Edge Middleware. Um, it keeps everything closest to the uh, database or the services that you've either requested or is closest to uh, where that user is requesting it from. So using middleware, developers can uh, ship multiple versions of the same pre-built static site by fetching uh, you know, qualifying data, either looking at users of a certain region and presenting um, you know, a custom variant to uh, a subset of users within the application or targeting maybe um, logged out users and giving them a, a different experience than folks that maybe are previously authorized into the platform. Um, these are things that you can determine in that middleware layer. Uh, so essentially providing that data to the website. So regardless of whether, uh, of how you're generating uh, the website, we can provide information to um, your app, uh, regardless of whether it's using SSR or SSG. Um, so let's uh, advance to the next slide here. So as we talk about that traditional personalization, that round trip to origin being that uh, what increases latency, um, looking at the, the ideal solution here in the next slide um, by comparison, that cache to edge response is a lot closer to where uh, your users are experiencing your application. So it brings that, um, that round trip origin, it's a lot shorter. Uh, we can provide information at the cache layer, uh, which is um, substantiated by Versatile Edge Middleware. And uh, this actually speeds things up quite a bit. So as we move things into edge middleware, uh, redirects, rewrites, geolocation. Um, I mean, as we talk about AV testing today a little bit further, but feature flags absolutely plays into that. All of these things can be made available at this, uh, this layer between the internet and your website and uh, basically provide the best possible experience for your users without increasing that latency. So this is that visual edge network can be instantaneous and uh, responsive at any point to your user. And then I'll pass it uh, back off to Steve to talk a little bit more about the solution. Yeah, so what we'll be covering in the demo today is sort of one kind of simple approach you can take that works just incredibly well with Vercel and Next.js, right? So the basic strategy here is we're gonna use edge middleware to rewrite the URL paths of incoming requests. And so just like you saw on the last slide, we can use any of those bits of information to make changes to the actual URL that's going to be hitting um, our web server. I mean, we're basically serverless these days, but you get the idea. We're gonna change the URL that will be served to the end users. So in this case, um, a couple really effective ways for personalization one in particular we'll focus on is just using cookies. So say you drop a cookie that says, hey, we've seen this user before, they're a return user. Um, or like Kylie said, they're authenticated, they're logged in user. In fact, I'm pretty sure that Vercel.com uses that to send you to the dashboard as opposed to the marketing site based on if you're logged in or not. Um, a common use case in e-commerce like we'll show today uh, is just tracking basic behaviors or past behaviors of a given visitor. So if they previously shopped uh, shirts, you might want to actually say, oh, okay, let's rewrite the URL to say, this is not just the homepage. This is the homepage of a shirt shopper. And we can use that in Next.js to actually serve up something different. So once we're rewriting those URLs to add some additional key value pairs that matter to us, then one technique that works amazingly well is using Next.js's incremental static regeneration or ISR. Doing that, we can make sure that we always have a static page available in the cache. And when anything new arises, we can use the fallback mode to then say, oh, we just got a homepage visit to a return visitor who shops shirts and, you know, in a certain geolocation, a certain A-B test group, let's go and populate that page now on the fly. Once we then take that information, all those key value pairs, and we'll show some code in a little bit, and query all the different backends or any APIs used to populate our page or 
even just logic right there in your front-end code, that then becomes part of the cache at the edge and is served forever onward for anybody who comes in with that same sort of set of uh, what you might call audiences uh, is a common common term. And again, those audiences come from logic you write that could be coming from the CDN directly like the geolocation, or it could be coming from a CDP like segment. So you use another service to group people into buckets, you ping that, and then you use that to personalize these pages. And then, yeah, at the very bottom, you can see any sort of CMS and services. So we'll specifically show Builder, sending that information to Builder to serve up unique content based on the visitor. Uh, but this could be any CMS, any service, any platform, any API that you want, you can be using this strategy with. Back to Kylie. So as we uh, talk more about collaborating between um, the two teams, uh, you know, we have your marketing team and then you have your developer team. Uh, we have uh, recently introduced a feature for preview deployments that allows users to leave a comment on uh, the preview deployment directly in line on a layer above the um, preview deployment itself uh, so that folks can discuss changes, um, as you can see featured in the image on the right hand side here. Um, maybe even recommending like a variant on a call to action. Uh, these things can be resolved in the user interface on that preview deployment. And then these conversations can be brought back to your team. Um, looking at the left-hand side, this is something that is automatically part of that preview deployment process now. So as you see on uh, visit preview next to it comments, you'll see how many comments have already been left or resolved. You can stay subscribed to those threads and uh, it's it's a really great way for folks to collaborate and, and continue those conversations about improving that user experience. This feature is super cool. <laughs> if y'all aren't using it, you really should be. Um, anyway, so now we can start talking about um, you know, actually being able to iterate on these experiments, right? The whole goal of experiments is to constantly be testing things, ideally as quickly and efficiently as possible. So the last thing we want to happen is us to have to deploy new code for every experiment. Uh, I'm sure Morgan would not love to ask, to ask Kylie every single time she wants to change the copy on a button. It'd be really nice to be able to just change the copy, run the experiment, see the results and continue. Because uh, on Kylie's side, Kylie and her team probably also don't want to be focused on button copy. They probably like to focus on something a little bit more interesting, like the testing framework itself, more than this, the simple iterations of test. So our goal here is to break up an interdependent workflow, like a waterfall workflow. So it's not like, okay, you know, here's the test marketing wants to run. Now let's add it to the engineering queue. As we all know, those are probably already multiple weeks long. So it goes to the back. So your experiment will be multiple weeks till maybe it reaches the light of day. You rig it up to maybe a CMS or some other things. You code it up, you preview it, you check it out, you deploy it. And then in worst case scenario, you could end up rolling backwards, right? You roll back your experiments because something else was broken in that deployment and it was just safer to just pull back to a prior version. Um, you could also find out that certain miscommunications happen. So you end up going back and forth through this long process. What we prefer is a decoupled workflow where the developer can integrate whatever tools they'd like that uh, leverage sort of the best possible performance and workflows for the team integrates nicely with your stack. Uh, developers can continue to update the site, update components, update the things that sort of matter to the developers sort of day to day and in general life. And then the marketing team should be able to take what's in there and run those experiments autonomously within a set of guide rails, right? So do we want the marketing team to change the entire site? Maybe not, but within certain regions, we would really like to not have to be asked to make basic changes. We'd like to let them do it. Um, and we tend to find that you know, when it comes to experimentation, the faster you can experiment, the better. You could think of it like a loop. It's the build, measure, learn loop, right? Every time you complete the loop, you learn something new, which can dictate a smarter next experiment. If that loop takes three months, then you're not gonna really learn a lot if you can only run four experiments per year. If each loop can take as little as a day or an hour, you can learn and optimize a lot faster. So we'll be talking about that. So one way to look at this is, are you experimenting on content or code? So in these diagrams, we use sort of these blue boxes to represent on a typical, say, for example, e-commerce website, regions that are usually kind of more content heavy, like the bulk of your homepage, or maybe below the fold on a product page, um, or various other kind of more promotional, more content heavy areas. And the sort of gray and white is things that are probably more code heavy, uh, things like the actual product details and stuff like that. For the more code heavy areas that you should really have already in your code base, you're gonna to wanna to use tools that are good for doing experiments within code. Something like LaunchDarkly is a popular choice where you can use feature flags and you can be dictating sort of groups, percentages, personalizations within your code base. And then for areas like content, 
ideally those are a little bit more self-servable to the marketing team. You don't need to be rigging up sort of changes to your code for content to be changing. And we mean, we tend to find when it comes to uh, experimentation, content changes are a little bit uh, non-trivial, right? So if you use a very strict headless CMS, that gives you, you know, maybe provide a field for uh, one line of text and one button. Next thing marketing is going to need is two buttons or no button or a new section or a different arrangement of sections, right? There's going to be a lot of needs that kind of break out of the boundaries because that's the goal of marketing is to experiment and learn. And the, the more you have a good balance of the guardrails here, the better. So when it comes to builder, we focus on the content side. And so in order to get around that problem of, of too many structured fields, not providing the sort of levers that a marketing team would need, which for a developer means constantly having to be involved with these marketing tests and tickets just to make some fairly basic changes, we move to a more component-driven model. So instead of you having to hard code all these pages and you add these hard coded fields and you change the fields all the time when the needs change, which means more deploys and more work that often the engineers uh, and most teams we work with, it's not their favorite work, adding a button then removing it and adding it again is not usually the, you know, get up in the morning, get excited for work type of work, uh, more doing something more infrastructure, more lasting, more interesting. Uh, and so we use this component driven model where the builder integration is a component. So you decide if, if builder should control the bulk of your homepage, a section here, you integrate a component and importantly, you register your components. So you probably already have a nice design system with a hero and a product card and a whatever. Let's just give the marketing team a region they can experiment with, a, a bounding box, a set of components that are the tools that they can add and rearrange. And then we can have a much cleaner sort of workflow for everybody. So that's how Builder works and that's how it helps solve this. So you add the component to your code base. Uh, at the end of the day, we're still just a headless CMS. We call ourselves a visual CMS. It's more of a superset of a headless CMS. So you fetch data as JSON that could either be structured data, um, your typical CMS field style, or it can be what we call visual data, which is actually a JSON representation of uh, visual content. Like your hero should go here with these props and you know a product should go here or a button should go here with these props. That then gives your non-development teams a drag and drop interface and they can just click to publish. And the cool part is we do all of this with, um, if you use React server components, Builder actually adds zero JavaScript to your site. Most modern SDKs add about five to 10 kilobytes. So it's, it's very, very small. It's all API driven and, and JSON data based. So like I mentioned, plugged into your stack, this is sort of the dream stack we'll be demoing, Vercel for delivering those experiments, the entire developer experience platform, Next.js, which is truly the most feature rich and performant framework uh, today for being able to, the most elegant part of this is how you can have your actual application code and your edge function middleware code right in one code base in a really seamless way. So it deploys all together and it just works. As you'll see, you update code one time and you can run infinite experiments without having to touch the code again, uh, but deploy code anytime you want still. So Builder is sort of our visual layer over there, and that's still connecting to any sort of app services, whatever, right? It could be e-commerce platforms, could be other things. Those can connect direct your code as well as through Builder for visual editing. And the coolest part is the edge middleware is just a couple lines of code. So that, that technique that we talked about where at the edge, we're gonna automatically look at some cookies or other attributes for the request, rewrite the URLs so that we can sort of serve up or we can produce different content for different visitors is basically nothing. <laughs> you can import a package from Builder, you can add it to your edge middleware and you're off to the races, which is really, really, really exciting. Um, oh yeah, and maybe I can just squeeze in one question that just came in through the chat. So a couple of questions, are these things framework agnostic or rack dependent? So everything we're talking about here is completely framework agnostic, both Builder as integrations, all modern frameworks and APIs for anything else, and Vercel's edge middleware. This whole end-to-end -end technique we're gonna show with Next.js, Vercel, and Builder, uh, but this could be Vercel and Svelte and Builder. This could be Vercel and Vue and some other services, not Builder. It actually is a completely generalizable technique, but I will say that you know when you're using platforms built for this use case uh, and integrations built for this use case, it'll be that much more seamless. And anyway, we'll show you in a minute, but then you can use Builder's UI to so just create these test groups and variations. Um, and those just become part of the API call. So if you know that you wanna target return visitors, country codes, um, shopping preferences, those just become key value pairs you send to the Builder API. And those become part of the UI. So now any team member can use a little selection picker to say, hey, this version of something should show this audience, this AV test percentage group, et cetera.
I love this, Steve. I'm, I was talking with my team about this and they were like, oh my gosh, that's, that sounds like a dream. So <laughs> yeah, you should try it. People are happy with it and there's a free tier. So ping us, um, actually anybody in here. I mean, ping our team if you want to help with any of this stuff, but uh, I appreciate that a ton. And I mean, to round things off, the big thing that you're going to find, and this is what you learned in making the platform too, is most importantly, as you're running experiments, you not only need to know sort of which test group is performing better, like which personalization or which test variation or whatever, um, you know, you don't just want to know what converts better, what has more engagement, what has more traffic, but you often need very granular insights as well. You know, you make a, let's say you make a full page in Builder and it's got 20 buttons. Well, who clicked what button? How much did this button make me more money than that button or that product sell? So that's where we can visualize it all for you. And the really cool part is all of these analytics are tied back to the content. So sometimes it can be challenging when you make a, a very personalized site and then you try and go to your BI tool and pinpoint sort of each metric back to a piece of content and it could get confusing. You can rig it up and actually build or supports piping all that data to your BI tool, but it can be a lot more uh, intuitive and self-servable for your marketing team to run experiments right there in the experiment, look at how it performed and continue. And the important part here is the heat maps really open up a lot as well. So you make this big grid and we can show you who's clicking on what and more importantly, uh, which is converting. So the dollar heat maps, the conversion heat maps are really interesting. You can see literally who engaged with what and how much revenue did that drive or how many signups did that drive, whatever your conversion metric is. Um, and the great part about that is, you know, we very much lean on this idea of zero cost abstractions, both with Vercel and Builder. If Vercel has a personalization feature, it's not going to slow your site down. There's a high bar for everything Vercel launches. And that's the same with Builder. So Traditionally, a heat map tool requires actually snapshotting pages and sending entire page contents back to a back end. Uh, but with Builder, no way, <laughs> we would never do that. Because we know the structure of the content, we can actually send incredibly lightweight, like tiny, like couple byte events and reconstruct on our back end these heat maps. So you get these full featured workflows in these modern edge friendly performant ways. So we will show all of this. So you don't have to just see me wave my hands. Oops, sorry. Demo is happening first and then questions. So. Why don't we transition over to that? We can put a little bit of words to what we're talking about. And so let's start by just showing our site. We'll have a link to the source code of the site in a minute, but here's our basic site. I've got this nice homepage. This is a fork of um, uh, our, the Vercel kind of commerce, Next.js commerce starter. It's a really beautiful starter. And I can browse around this site. So I've got this homepage, it's made in Builder. I have this cool little Chrome extension that'll highlight like, okay, cool, on this page, Header and footer is right there in our code, and the blue highlighted area is made in Builder. I could, of course, browse around. Everything is just lightning fast. It's all Next.js and Edge and everything really beautiful and cool. And there's my basic site, but it's neat. It's just a little boring. Like we're acting like everybody's a newcomer. Everybody's seeing the same homepage. I could open up, you know, a new incognito window. It loads fast. Obviously, you can see it loads instantly, but yeah, the site's a little boring. Everybody sees the same page. So let's start changing that. So we've got Builder hooked up to the site. Uh, Builder is a headless CMS. It's structured like any other headless CMS. And so I've got a couple content types in here. I've got a page. So we could use that to make variations of our homepage or new landing pages on new URLs. Uh, that integration is super simple. You can see it in the, uh, in the demo GitHub repo. And we can have some sections. Like we actually made a customizable section of our product pages, which we'll get back to. But let's open up sort of this generic homepage that we have. And we'll see that inside of Builder, we'll connect exactly to your live site. And you'll see a visual editor using your components of your actual homepage. Now, I don't want to touch this one because this one actually is probably out there in production. It's collecting some analytics, but I want to make some more interesting versions. And so before I start editing, I'm going to duplicate this. And we'll make our new kind of homepage, whatever. We're going to make our revamped version of the homepage. What's cool is this is just a total drag and drop editor. We use some funny tricks to basically be able to do this in an incredibly lightweight and performant way. And so you can see here, if I delete everything on the page that we kind of just get this ad block button, right? It's a bit of a marketer's dream because you know it's kind of like what happened back in my past life at ShopStyle is 
every single update to the site was this long queue. And eventually our marketing team, I think they grabbed Webflow and they made a version of one of their pages they'd asked for forever in Webflow. And they're like, hey team, can you just kind of like copy paste this onto the, the site, the shop style site? And it's like, uh, it doesn't work that way. And they're like, well, we'll embed it like a YouTube video. It's like, oh, it doesn't work that way. And like, okay, what about you take all the shop style stuff like this custom product catalog and all these custom components and put it in Webflow. And it's like, ah, oh, it doesn't work that way. But ultimately, I mean, that was kind of the core idea. Like, what if, what if we could visualize our components? What if we could just drag and drop with them and change to whatever we want? Like maybe this variation, oops, sorry, messed up my highlighting. Maybe this variation, like I'll just make a test group. I'll just say, hey, here's test variation A and some nice description. I can add, you know, again, more components from our code base. This nice content container is handy. We can add some product cells connected to your e-commerce catalog. So maybe I want to be showing the shirt. Maybe I want to use the nice slim format. Maybe I want to add another one kind of side by side here and we'll show the jacket. Uh, that looks nice. Maybe I'll make it a little bit more even, use that slim version. And maybe we'll go in here and add a title. You know, one thing that can happen a lot is you also don't necessarily want to have to deploy anything new for just basic new styles. And so if you give anybody styling permissions, which is up to you to control, you can allow a little bit here. Like this doesn't look very good as a heading, but we can just scroll up that uh, font size and edit this a lot like Figma responsively. And let's say, hey, here's our most popular products. Awesome. And so let's just jump in and make this an A-B test. Again, we're not having to go to our deployments, to our code, any of that. We're just gonna go in the UI and make an A-B test group. Uh, add as many variations as you want, change the percentages, whatever you want. Maybe we'll do a 50-50 test and we'll go back and we'll edit the test variation that I made. And this one, we'll call it test variation B. And one funny thing we always found at ShopStyle is the more, and this is what you learn from experimentation, you could guess all day at what people want to see when they visit your site. But when you run tests, you get data. It tells you what people want to see. There's no more debating it. You can see it. And so a really frequent thing we learned actually is the more you put products down, the more you convert less. The more you put products more above the fold, front and center, the more you convert more. This page might be a little bit uglier, but we can see if it converts better. So I'll publish that and I want to do one other thing and then we'll kind of explore how this influences the Next.js site, how it shows up on our Vercel logs and stuff like that. In fact, I'm going to open up um, and forgive me when I screen share my graphics card goes crazy, but uh, I'll open up something on this demo repo in a minute. But uh, one other thing I want to do is go over and I'm going to make one more copy of that home page. And this time I'm going to start personalizing the contents. So I have that version with A-B tests that will be running in a moment, uh, or actually technically would already be live. And I'm gonna make one more copy of this original homepage and I'm gonna target it using personalization. So one thing that we do, um, I will show it here in GitHub. So we just have a simple convention that you can copy where we just use cookies. So what we're gonna do is for any attributes you want, just set a cookie. So we just use this personalization namespace. So inside of the demo site code, we do stuff like return visitor, true for return visitor. Uh, we also will set things like what you shopped. So if I go over and I visit the sort of t-shirt page, we'll flag it, oh, okay, you shop t-shirts, you have some level of interest there. We'll drop that as a cookie. Anything in cookies, at least in this demo, that has that personalization dot prefix will become part of the URL. So this slash page will become slash page, you know, return visitor equals true, uh, shops equals shirts, stuff like that. So over in Builder, we can start customizing that. So in fact, we can go in here, let's call this our shirt lover page. We can choose to say, okay, this is gonna be at our shirt loving audience. So shirt shoppers. And then we can tailor this a bit to them, right? So welcome shirt lover. We have a new shirt. And then we can focus you know, on this shirt. So let's get rid of this grid. Let's just make it the nice big cell, make it nice and massive like that. Let's get rid of anything else. Uh, I kind of do like that slightly more low profile version. So we'll go with that slim version. We can add other buttons and fun stuff. I mean, it's just kind of fun to drag and drop with your components from your code and just be editing things, links and Wahoo. But you get the idea. This will be our shirts personalized version of our homepage and we'll publish that. Now, 
Uh, I have it set up to do stale while revalidate. You could also use uh, on-demand ISR. So these publishes actually update your site immediately. Uh, forgive me, I got lazy and I just left it to on-demand or to uh, just revalidate based ISR. But basically what I wanna show is we have this site now. I populated a little bit of new stuff. And so what I wanna show also is the Vercel log. So I'll refresh this. And so obviously this is deployed to Vercel. And I want to show we added to our middleware a little bit of logging in here. So as requests come in, I will browse around. We can see. So in fact, maybe I'll start incognito and say, OK, a request. Perfect. Let's go here. So I think let's populate one more request. It's really cool to see these real time logs. And awesome. I think we have some other people browsing the site right now as, as I am demoing. But anyway. We can look, and I think this is my simple request. So we wrote this slash. Let me make this nice and big. We wrote a generic request to the homepage to slash with parameters. We do a little hashing, but basically the parameters we have here is just that this is a return visitor. Now, as I browse, browse around, let's say I go to t-shirts and back, you probably saw two things happen. So one and, okay, sorry. Other people are viewing the site, so I catch all the logs as easily. Uh, if there wasn't so much traffic, you can see, uh, here's a simple example, we'll pause it here. So this is a homepage visit to someone who shops jackets. Um, this one was not me. You can see over here, I shop shirts. And actually, if I refresh this page, I'm always gonna see that shirt lover version. If I go away um, and maybe open a new tab, again, I'm seeing this version of the page. Now, let's say I go to Safari or something, and maybe I open up the generic Ah, now I'm seeing my test variation. So now I'm seeing the default home page that I made, not personalized to anyone. And I'm seeing test variation A. And again, this is crazy. There's a lot of stuff going on here, but this is all just being served from the edge. A private window showing me test variation B. This is an A-B test to the generic audience. So if you've never shopped anything, you're gonna see that. If I go and shop shirts and browse around, uh, you will see on future visits. Oops, sorry, I don't know my own keyboard shortcuts with Safari. I don't use Safari much. But there we go, on a subsequent visit after I had actually been shopping for shirts, we are seeing the shirts version. And just to put a little bit of sense to all this variations, let's go back to Builder and we can see it in the content list. So over here in the list, you can see everything can be prioritized. You can drag and drop to prioritize. So you saw when I opened Safari, I saw the new generic homepage, which had two A-B test groups, different windows see different test groups, and then the test groups are sticky. So as I navigate around, I stay in that test group. Now, if you switch to actually uh, browsing shirts, you will for then, then on see that shirt lover page. And this is not something that just affects pages. You can do this for things like parts of pages. So for instance, we have a section at the bottom of our product page. Again, drag and drop to create whatever wonderful, beautiful creations that you want to start marketing sort of what the materials of these awesome shirts are, um, show something specific or recommended products to this visitor. If you know they shop jackets, let's show jackets that go well with that shirt. If they only shop shirts, let's just show other shirts. Um, you can really, really kind of get exciting and crazy. And one last thing that's just fun to show is if you're ever wondering who's seen what, we have this cool little debugging tool as well to show you the active tests. You can navigate the site. You can switch to different audiences. So like, what does the shirt shopper see? You see the shirt lover page that we just made. What does the jacket shopper see? Nothing special, just the generic A-B test. So why don't I pause here? Actually, I'll show one last thing and then I will shut up and pause. Just remember the coolest things about this. One is we're making infinite tests and customizations without having to deploy, but we can deploy awesome new components at any time and use those. Two is it's all delivered at the edge and super fast. Uh, and three, each team could focus on kind of their area of expertise. At the end of the day, you can always pop in and look at your analytics. Uh, let's see how much traffic we've got on this page. Hey, look, it's going up today. Uh, I don't think we have conversions connected, so we won't see conversion rates, but the coolest thing is we can see a real-time heat map as well. Again, didn't integrate conversion tracking, so you won't see dollars in here, but you will see everything people are clicking on. This can be a blast because you'll usually be surprised. You throw, you show two products and you assume you'll get an even distribution of clicks. Most of the time you'll find that actually everybody's clicking on one thing, nobody's clicking on the other thing. So great thing you can do is your marketing team can go, great, remove the thing that's not converting, add something new, run test and continue. Um, at the risk of being boring, why don't, maybe this is a good time, do you think Morgan to jump into questions?
Absolutely. We do have a few questions over in the Q&A, but um, if there's anything at all that you want us to dig back into, just feel free to add it over into the Q&A or into the chat and we'll get it addressed. Um, one question for you is, how can I how can I pipe the data out of Builder or do I need to use Builder to view the data? Yes, good question. So super easy to pipe the data out of Builder. For non-trivial use cases, we recommend using both. Like the fact that you can just see who's clicking on a button in Builder is great, but you are gonna wanna also have this data in your BI tools, Amplitude, stuff like that. And we provide very basic hooks to just shoot off the tracking. At the end of the day, the rule of thumb is this is your code. When you say Builder component load here, you can add amplitude.track and we provide nice little hooks for you to do that. Awesome. And then another question from Kirk is, where did the cookie get set again? Was that in Builder? Ah, great question. That's just in the code. So I can actually show you, whoops. So if we go over to our Next.js code, which you can see here, um, I believe inside of sites, inside of we've got a product page. So we want pages, product slug, and in here cookies, cookies.set. There we go. So this is just generic. Somebody's browsing your site and you're setting cookies. Nothing special at all in here. Um, the special part is being able to just configure who sees what and the edge splitting of that. But yeah, this is just set cookies for whatever you want to target off of in your code, whatever way that you like. And again, cookies is just an example. You can do this in a variety of means, but this tends to work quite well. Um, can I piggyback that question? Uh, yeah. The same way that you're splitting traffic uh, in Builder, can you split traffic on folks within that cookie or a different um, audience if that if you choose to set it in code? Yeah, a hundred percent. No, that's a great question. So yeah, frequently you'll probably have multiple things going on. You'll have somebody in multiple buckets at once and you may have split tests within there. And then, yeah, you can do exactly that. Like within this cookie, you can actually be running 50-50 tests and stuff like that. And luckily the middleware appends all of that information automatically and Builder lets you configure it automatically. Uh, Vercel truly is a just, just works <laughs> like magic platform. It's pretty amazing. Very cool. Um, a question um, that we have here is how should we render pages when using Builder IO with Next.js? Should we use SSR or ISR and why? Oh, that is a great question. So uh, it's my opinion that for most people, ISR is best. If you're using SSR, be very careful about caching. You're going to want to set the right cache headers, stale while revalidate caching, stuff like that. ISR is kind of the happy medium where uh, in the beautiful part, and I can probably show it a little bit better here go back in our readme, um, the beautiful part of all of this, okay, here, is that and why this works so well with SSR or ISR, but I, I like ISR um, as a default at least, is that, yeah, as we're actually making unique paths per these groups. So you are actually having some dynamic paths that we can generate those static pages and then fall back with fallback mode on demand. Um, and yeah, all these parameters become part of the path. So again, works great with SSR, but ISR is a little bit more um, kind of just works magically in this format. And Kylie, just in case some people don't know what ISR is, could you give us a quick TLDR? Uh, incremental, uh, incremental site generation, I believe is the actual, I feel like I never actually have to define this one, um, but essentially uh, loading incrementally uh, instead of all at once, so directly from the cache, which is why Steve's calling out. It's important to be aware of that cache. Um, I feel like that's the root of so many of my my headaches as a developer. Yes. Yeah, ISR just makes, makes caching magic. SSR is know what you're doing. And if you know what you're doing, you can do it amazingly, but yeah, you gotta know. Awesome. Okay, we have another question here. How can you set up a reverse proxy to another domain in order to provide the cores header? when using Next.js and Party Town. <laughs> so that's that's so funny. Uh, sorry, Party Town is like kind of unrelated, but people love to ask Party Town questions everywhere they can. Um, there is a doc on this, just Google reverse proxy. Uh, there is a doc in the Party Town docs that'll go over this. And one thing that could be cool to add, I'm gonna talk about this in Next.js Conf a bit, but it would be cool to add that in Next.js by default. Next.js is capable of doing this uh, when using the experimental worker strategy. So watch my Next.js Conf and check out the docs. You'll, you'll find good answers there. Awesome. Is um, Builder optimized for SEO? 
Oh yeah, hundred percent. So the the two core things you need to know is at the end of the day, one, this is just your code, your components, just like anything else. So the rule of thumb is we're not doing anything fancy. There's no iframes, there's no weird stuff. It's just clean, compliant, React and uh, ADA optimized and SEO optimized code. But again, it's mostly just React components with divs, H1s, et cetera, if you choose to add that. So everything's optimized for performance, image formats, et cetera, uh, as well as SEO, everything is scannable. Um, again, just like you wrote the code by hand, uh, as well as there's a custom field system. So you can make it, in fact, I can show you, for all these sort of pages and whatnot, you can add as many custom fields uh, as you like so that you can fill in SEO information. So here's like the SEO title, hello world. Uh, add the description, add images to populate OG images. And these are all customizable. You just decide the schema, load it into your code, into the Next.js head tag component, et cetera, however you want. Uh, and importantly, uh, we're very mindful of making sure what the crawler sees is optimized, meaning whatever your default is. So if you run A-B tests, whatever the default variation is, that's what bots will see. Um, as well as if you do personalization, again, your unpersonalized version is what bots will see. So you have full control over that and you're able to be mindful of it. Very cool. Very cool. Um, question for you, uh, Steve, can you share some similarities, differences, or advantages with some other CMS solutions? Yeah, it's a good question. So at the end of the day, all headless CMSs are kind of the same. It's a thin layer over a database. So you make database schemas, you put a form on top of it, and you can use the form. And that's kind of what you see here. <clears throat> what Builder does that's unique is we add on two specific features. Uh, feature one is experimentation. So the ability right here to configure the A-B tests and the personalizations, which all come from our API. So we deliver it from the edge, uh, as opposed to you having to do anything client side, like we talked about, we don't want. And the second one is this visual drag and drop editor. That's the main thing you won't find in other, other headless CMS. Structured data is supported in Builder and works great for many use cases. But for something that's inherently visual, like the makeup of a page or sections of a page, the drag and drop with your components unlocks a lot and saves your marketing team from asking for new buttons and your engineering team from having tickets for moving buttons and stuff like that. Yeah, I think the drag and drop is just a marketer's dream um, <laughs> to be able to move quickly, learn, then go back to the team to talk about like the larger, larger projects that they want to build together. And then I think the third thing that makes y'all different is obviously you all, that your, your team is incredible to work with. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, same goes for Vercel and Vercel's team too. So it was not overwhelmingly obvious and it probably needs to be said repeatedly, but like all the stuff you're seeing is actually powered by Vercel. In fact, a lot of the stuff on the builder platform itself. So the fact that we're able to do this, it's cool that our UIs can configure it all, but it's Vercel's ability to deliver it at this insane speed and their incredible team that makes Next.js is what makes all of this possible truly. Um, okay, another question for us is how does Next.js with Builder compare versus using it with Quick? Oh, that's a great question. So with Next.js, you could have a way more mature and feature-rich framework. For almost everybody, Next.js is the obvious choice. Quick is a good choice if you're actually having serious problems with uh, hydration costs. So that's more fitting if you're like an amazon.com and you have tons of code and that you need a solution that Quick can offer. Remember Quick's in beta, it's early. So it's good for some kind of, you have a really hair on fire problem. It's not gonna have a lot of the features and the DX that Next.js has. Um, on top of that, um, You'll definitely find that a lot of Quick is trying to be as similar to Next.js as possible, but again, you're never going to be the same as exactly Next.js. So pick your poison, do your research, but for most people, use Next.js, and some people, if you really need Quick, can be a cool alternative as well. And supporting all the same things that we saw here and integrated with Vercel really cleanly as well. Awesome. Okay, so we have um, another question. How to share components between different projects and clients? That's a great question. That's actually something we're working now on making more content around, but we actually, that's a very common use case. One of our most common customer bases are uh, holding companies, like a company that owns a bunch of other e-commerce brands or just multiple companies within it, and they centrally manage it. So it's a little bit hard to answer this in one, one sentence besides the pattern we've seen work really well is set up a multi-tenant Next.js project. So a Next.js project that actually can serve multiple sites at once and the edge rewrites can actually power that and then have a core set of components and you can use um, something like theme UI is a good one. Any themable component system can actually theme the different sites differently. And uh, 
I'd love to follow up with some content on a more in-depth answer to this. In fact, if we know who asked it, we can actually follow up directly because we're making content about this. Short answer is it's totally possible. It actually works amazingly. Longer answer is we're setting up some more sort of example projects, maybe a webinar like this to more in-depth explain how to approach that. Okay. This one was from an anonymous attendee, but if you want to follow up, we're going to show you how to get in contact with Steve. So don't you worry. Um, we have just a uh, last few questions here. Are personalized components registered in Builder.io SSR? Yeah, so if the question is like, I have a component and that component um, fetches its own personalization, like a set of personalized products. Yeah, you can register that. That works especially well with React server components with Next.js. Uh, we'll see if at the Next.js conf there's anything announced regarding that, but I know it's already sort of there. If you recall if in alpha. Um, but there is a way to do that in builder handling and augmenting that data fetching as well. But yeah, short answer is when you're getting those requests that you have all this personalized information that could be passed to these components and the components themselves can fetch personalized data and be included here. A very common use case. One really cool one. We have a demo with Salesforce Commerce Cloud where you have like an Einstein recommender component. You drop it in and you can even choose like what recommender algor algorithm do you want? And that can be um, dictated by the audiences or the individual kind of user or visitor ID. Awesome. Okay. And then we have one final question. It was piggybacking off of that original cookie question from Kirk. So he says, assuming that's because the server can read the cookie, correct? Yeah. So this is, uh, this is really clarifying. You know, what's funny is cookies have a funny reputation because of how they've been sort of abused in the past. But if you look at cookies as just a fundamental unit for sharing small snippets of data between your client and your server, and the server could be the edge, that's where we really care about it here. It's a phenomenal sort of communication mechanism. So that's where you just, any information you wanna share between the edge and your client, cookies is a really, really good gateway to do that. And that's why we use it here. Also makes me hungry, um, reminds me that I didn't eat my breakfast. Um, okay, well, that is it for all of our questions. I think we can head back over to our slides to just wrap up this incredible conversation. So uh, we went through all the questions. I just wanted to remind everyone, um, both Steve and Kylie will be speaking in separate sessions at Next.js Conf, but we are hosting our annual Next.js Conference on October 25th. It's going to be incredible. There will be all of these virtual sessions that you can join. Um, so please use this QR code to register. There's a super fun game there if you haven't registered already. And I will say that if you unlock it, you get to open up this Wordle, um, which is a play off, off of Wordle. So it's super fun, a little Easter egg in there for you. Um, but we definitely wanna see you there. And then also, um, like I mentioned, we are going to email you the recording here so you can share this with your friends, share this with your coworkers, rewatch any sections that you missed. Um, but also if you wanna get in contact with anyone today, um, here's our information, reach out to them on Twitter. Um, or you can always scan this QR code and we will follow back up with you from the Vercel team. But with that, I just want to say thank you to everyone for listening in. This was a great conversation this morning and we hope to see you at Next.js Conf.